the the first episode rolls together a lot of familiar themes i think of the gothic um the idea of genealogical inheritance of some kind of curse mm. um, it, it because often the Gothic is about some some sort of um, inheritance that has gone awry. Um, there's been a usurper often in Gothic tales, so you need to restore somebody to their rightful position. Or it's about some sort of occulted or secret in the family history that must come to light. Want to listen to this Ivory Tower Boiler Room episode ad-free? Head on over to our Patreon, where you will get this episode and all of our episodes ad-free. And you can see our video episode, including this one right now, where you'll see my beautiful face and the guest's beautiful face. Who doesn't love that? And I am so excited to announce that all of you can get a one-week free trial on our Patreon. Join the ITBR professor level and you unlock all of Mary's True Crime and Academia Patreon episodes, our rewatch show, including Queer as Folk and Smash. You can even listen to us dissect Scream and The Exorcist. So head to patreon.com backslash ivory tower boiler room, join the one week free trial and see what you're missing out on. And while you're at it, please follow us on Instagram and TikTok at ivory tower boiler room rate, follow, and subscribe to us on Apple and Spotify podcasts. Thanks so much, and I hope that you enjoy all of our Ivory Tower Boiler Room episodes. Hi, everyone. Happy day after Valentine's Day. I'm so excited for this gothic Valentine's episode. So Dr. Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock comes back on the podcast. If you haven't listened to his episode about all things horror, gothic literature, pop culture, you need to listen to that. That was about a year ago from Broadview Press. And then James Yeary comes on the ITBR. And you just listened to an episode with his girlfriend, Brooke Walsh, who has Brooke Walsh photography on Long Island. And we talked about Britney Spears with her. So I hope you enjoy this episode. You're also going to hear a special Valentine's themed ad from our sponsor, The Soapbox, which is in Port Jeff Village. It's a bath and body boutique and happening on February 25th at 4 p.m. at Burrito, which is a beautiful, I always call it the Miami of Port Jeff Village restaurant. It's a really nice Mexican restaurant. We are having a reality TV trivia night event at 4 p.m., $5 in advance. You can get tickets on ivorytowerboilerroom.com in the event section. There are going to be happy hour specials, gifts from seven different Port Jeff Village and Setauket area businesses. So if you know anyone who's on Long Island, please spread the word. It is Aparito, and it's going to be about two hours. Please get a group of your friends together, make it an early dinner or, you know, an afternoon snack with drinks. There'll be some people from the Bravo universe calling in for trivia questions. So I can't wait for you to see who's going to appear. And then on March 3rd on Zoom, we have our next book club. So we are discussing Leah Remini's Troublemaker. That was the Scientology expose. That's happening at 4 p.m. Head to ivorytowerboilerroom.com. Go down to events. You'll see the trivia event there, and you'll see the way to RSVP for the Leah Remini book club. Okay, that's all I have to report, and I can't wait for you all to hear this episode, and welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Love and gothic TV and literature is in the air. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and when I'm not here on the podcast, I am consulting with small businesses, undergraduate students, graduate students, podcasters, and those in media. So if you're curious about 
the work that I've done with my consultation services, you could just type me in on Google, Ivory Tower Boiler Room, and you'll see a few reviews pop up. I've worked on college admission essays for undergraduate students. I've revamped and expanded a small business's social media marketing campaign right here in Port Jefferson, New York. And I've also worked on a graduate student's thesis for her physician assistant program. So if you want to seek me out or inquire about my consultation services, just email me. That's the easiest way to reach me at ivorytowerboilerroom at gmail.com. That's easy to remember. And tis the season for college admission essays, both undergraduate and graduate, thesis writing, dissertation writing. Um, do you want to create a podcast and you don't know where to begin? Media work, um, how to open a TikTok, how to start creating videos on TikTok, what to do with your Instagram, all of that I have done. So just reach out to me. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I'm really excited because this is a hot takes, honest opinions, cultural recap, bringing together Gothic minds. So I want to first introduce you to a repeat guest. If you haven't heard his podcast on pop culture, Gothic literature, composition, the mad scientists, Guide to Composition, all things, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Weinstock. Welcome back, Jeffrey, to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, and a new guest of the ITBR, James Yeary, who I actually know in real life, which is fun to have him on the Zoom. He is a thriller, gothic, creative writer. Uh, so James, I know from Stony Brook adjacently. So hi, James. Welcome to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. So first, to just jump into the fall of the House of Usher, um, I wanted to ask you both as a starting question, did it surprise you that this series was even made? Like, were you surprised that Poe's stories and poems were ripe for a 2023 modern day retelling of sorts? You know, I'll pitch it to you, Jeffrey. Uh no, I wasn't surprised at all, given what Mike Flanagan has done leading up to this point, because he did first um, uh, The Haunting of Hill House, just as, as The Haunting, and then he did The Haunting of Bly Manor, which was Henry James's Turn of the Screw. So it seemed very much sort of in keeping with his trajectory that he would do something with Poe. And you've just brought to my mind all of those series. He's going, he's working his way back in reverse chronology. <laughs> That's so I'm true. just curious, what's next? Anne Radcliffe from the 1700s, or um, is he, how far can we take this gothic lens? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Uh, Shakespeare, maybe we'll find something there. Uh, and then James, yeah, what did you think of just this series being an adaptation of all of these Poe works? It's it's beyond impressive, and I think that all of, um, uh, as Jeffrey said, all of Mike Flanagan's series showcase that because not only um are are these series one particular story or even two particular stories mike flanagan is able to take handfuls of stories uh like the haunting of Bly manor was i think four or five different henry james ghost stories rolled into one and um it's it's that's a daunting thing to do that to take uh many many short stories and merge them into one storyline uh and you know adapting stuff from the 1800s or in the 1700s it, it's not easy especially how mike flanagan is able to translate these things into a a you know a storyline that takes place in 2023 a modern uh retelling of it 
it's not an easy thing to do from a writing perspective. It's very difficult, and he does it so well that he makes it look easy. Yeah, so, I mean, I first am just curious what you both thought about the fall of the House of Usher being our frame narrative, right? Like, I, like wearing my Post shirt here, the Post Studies Association, when I did my queer take on Poe, it was actually about the fall of the House of Usher. That's my favorite story. Um, and I was more interested in like the narcissistic lens of the narrator and Roderick and um, what could be going on between their intimacy, which isn't really focused on here. Um, I mean, it is interesting to me that the detective is um, queer, like is gay, but we kind of get that in a reference. Um, but all of that aside, like why the fall of the House of Usher? Like, do you but this makes sense for both of you as a frame narrative, uh, Jeffrey. I had a lot of anxiety going into it, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, both because I think Flanagan in the past has had a tendency to sabotage himself as he gets near the ends of his series, which I can mm -hmm. go into more detail if you want. Uh, what he did Please. at the end of, of um, The Haunting of Hill House was nine tenths superb. And that 10th episode, just I, I was so angry at that ending that I was literally shouting at the screen when it, it changed. He changed the famous line, whatever walks there walks alone to it being a kind of family reunion that mm -hmm. felt to me like a complete betrayal of what Jackson had done with Hill House. And, yeah. and similarly, I was not thrilled with the conclusion of Midnight Mass, where he again kind of descends into these endless monologues. It, it ceases to be driven by plot and it becomes a lot of exposition and just a lot of talking. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was also anxious about it because of the connection to Poe. Um, as somebody who teaches Poe, writes about Poe, I was a little concerned what he was going to do with Poe. Um, and initially, when I heard he was doing The Fall of the House of Usher, I thought to myself, how is he possibly going to spin this into eight episodes or 10 episodes? Uh, but it quickly became clear to me, as, and I went in cold, like I tried to avoid reading anything about it before watching it, that he was using that the idea of Usher as a kind of frame narrative um, a, a, to loosely string together different post stories. Um, and I ended up being really happy with what he did with it. And I think he did stick the landing this time. Like, I think he managed to carry the momentum all the way through. Um, and with lots of Easter eggs for Poe fans. Um, but I think it was also intelligible to people who probably don't have much of a background in Poe. Like, you could still follow the plot and see where things went, but it certainly helped if you were familiar with the stories that he was adapting. Yeah, James? Yeah, I, I think I, I felt a little bit of anxiety going into it as well, especially after I watched maybe the first half of the first episode, because um, I had that voice in the back of my head that, you know, uh, watching trailers for it and sort of the build up, uh, I was being a little selfish and was thinking, well, uh, I really want them to set this in the 1800s. That would be so cool to have it be a period uh, piece where it's, it's it's you know, set in, in Edgar Allan Poe's time in the, you know, the mid uh, 1800s. So I had that part of me that was being a little selfish and was like, oh, I don't know if I love this whole sort of succession uh, aesthetic of these, you know, these wealthy people with, you know, running PR campaigns. I was like, oh, I don't know. Um, but then, uh, like, like, like Jeffrey said, as it as it moved along, I, I sort of settled in and started to really appreciate it. And I, I had to almost force myself out of that um, mindset of expecting it to be well in the 1800s because Poe stories were in the 1800s and um you know uh i had to remind myself that it is based on these stories and is not a a concrete replay of these stories and once i was able to do that and separate it and think well this is based on poe's work mm -hmm. uh, i started enjoying it a lot more and then once i got through the episode two episode three i really settled in and started loving it well, and Jeffrey, just as like a quick tutorial, because this is your wheelhouse of teaching the American Gothic, like, is it safe to assume that the Salem witch trials or like how we remember um, the Gothic from the Puritans, like that really did set off a lot of um, Gothic fiction? Like I'm thinking of Hawthorne's scarlet letter with the witch trial like we have that um witch trial example we have what poe does 
um, playing around with the American, like the indigenous land being something to be fearful of. Um, I mean, like that's the 1800s tradition, but is it really like the Puritan period and onward that we think of the American Gothic or is there an American Gothic that's indigenous, like before the Puritans? So you all know that I am such a fan of musical theater and classic movies. So I can't wait for you all to listen to one of my good friend's podcasts. It's called That Old Gay Classic Cinema, hosted by Christian Garcia. It's a podcast that looks at classic cinema films that we know and love. And he was inspired by Turner Classic Movies and The Great Movie Ride. Remember that amazing ride where the Wicked Witch of the West rose up in a burst of flame in Disney. That was one of my favorite rides. I'm so sad it closed. So while looking at classic films, Christian is so excited to look at it with a queer lens. And he brings on friends like myself to talk about all of these films. I was on the first episode when we discussed The Sound of Music. I've been on an episode of Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. He just released an episode about the Philadelphia story. He's done Meet Me in St. Louis, Sweet Charity, Psycho, Mary Poppins, Hello, Dolly. He had on Down the Yellow Brick Road hosts and the Garland Gab hosts to talk about The Wizard of Oz. So make sure that you listen to That Old Gay Classic Cinema on Apple and Spotify and follow him on TikTok and Instagram at That Old Gay Classic Cinema. Okay, start watching the classic movies and make sure you listen to Christian's podcasts. Are you a fan of LGBTQ plus books, plays, movies, TV shows? Well, then I have the magazine for you. It's called The Gay and Lesbian Review. The GNLR is a bi-monthly magazine of history, culture, and politics that publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies. Each issue brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles focused on a unifying theme, and it brings together the leading minds on the topic. So I just had on Dr. Richard Schneider Jr., the founder and editor-in-chief of the GNLR, for the GNLR's 30th anniversary. Happy birthday, GNLR. Dr. Richard Schneider talked about their special volume called Outer Appearances, More Faces from the Annals of the GNLR, illustrations by Charles Heffling. They cover current LGBTQ artists such as Harvey Firestein, Melissa Etheridge, Alan Cumming, James Whiteside, Alison Bechdel, and even David Sedaris, and of course, many others like Stephen Sondheim. There's even a supplemental issue that comes with your commemorative volume. And Andrew Halloran, the writer of Dancer from the Dance, he reviews a book called Morris about E.M. Farster's Morris, written by one of our ITBR guests, David Grevin. So we can't wait for you all to experience this beautiful 30th anniversary GNLR issue. Have you heard some of my GNLR interviews, including Dr. Andrew Lear's discussion about male male love in ancient Greek society and Ignacio Darnad opening and blasting the closet door in the queer male art world? Well, definitely make sure you listen to them after this episode. Head to glreview.org. Make sure you subscribe to their magazine. You'll see there's a section that says subscribe at the top. Enter the promo code ITBR50. That's ITBR50 to receive 50% off, 50% off any print or digital subscription. Enjoy your reading. The way that I would think about it is when you're dealing with the Puritans, it's kind of like the Gothic prehistory. Mm. If you want to talk about the Gothic novel per se in the United States, it typically is associated with Charles Brockton Brown as kind of the father of the American Gothic, who became an influence on Poe, who then begat H.P. Lovecraft and so on. Um, But a lot of that sort of mindset is something that I think is inherited from the Puritans and their insistence that uh, the supernatural is real and it it sort of we um and it's intrusive um yeah. that it's 
part of our existence. Cotton Mather in Wonders of the Invisible World starts off by saying nobody can doubt that we have a hundred um, preternatural things before our eyes every day. Um, so, and for the Puritans, it was just trying to make sense of things because nothing happened to the universe without God's explicit permission. So if your cattle sickened or died um, or something else terrible happened, this was a message from God. So there was a lot of soul searching involved to try and figure out in what way they had erred in the sight or what of God or, or what message was being conveyed. So on the one hand, I do think that Puritan religious mindset kind of sows the ground in a way for the, the Gothic that will later kind of spring forth. And the other part, I think, as you pointed out, is just the omnipresent specter of the frontier um, in early America. You didn't have to go too far off beyond the eastern seaboard for it really to be wilderness, um, which was a, a place of peril and also a place of uh, indigenous tribes who then be kind of become kind of supernaturalized as an enemy and a threat that needs to be uh, addressed. So I think those two things together Kind of Puritan religiosity and the fact of the frontier become building blocks for an American Gothic. Is the European Gothic much earlier? Like, I mean, Anne Radcliffe and others in Europe, like the British tradition, I know, is like the romantic, romantic period or even the late 1700s. But is there anything to your knowledge, Jeffrey, of like us using the word Gothic literature in the Renaissance, or does it really get tied to religiosity, like no. Dante's Inferno, for example? The the idea of the Gothic is interesting. It's, I mean, because it's associated originally with Northern Germanic tribes, the Goths, that mm. spread across Europe in the fifth, sixth, uh, fifth and sixth centuries, and then you you jump forward to the Renaissance, who start to use the word Gothic to refer to a style of architecture that was out of fashion and that was associated with the Goths. So things that were dark and heavy and ponderous were referred to as Gothic. So it became an adjective used for archaic uh, architecture. And then it's in the 1700s that it then becomes a more general term to describe anything that's kind of uncouth and barbaric and out of date. And it's um, Horace Walpole's The Castle of Otranto in 1750. Six, I think, um, which is credited as being the first Gothic novel. And it presents itself as being a recovered medieval manuscript mm. um, ab about a haunted castle, essentially. Um, and then after it was successful, Walpole stepped forward and revealed himself as the actual author of it. Um, the biggest names associated with the British Gothic, though, it's in the 1790s, where you have Anne Radcliffe on the one hand and Matthew Lewis on the other with his notorious The Monk. Um, mm -hmm. On the American side, where we really start to get something like a Gothic novel is just at the cusp of the 19th century. Charles Brockton Brown, I mentioned, um, is often considered to be the first American Gothic novelist. And he's followed by Washington Irving, who wrote a lot of comic tales. But then we get Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. Um, and then Hawthorne, of course, and Herman Melville. Um, so yeah. it's, it, for the, on the American side, it's a 19th century phenomenon. Yeah, the reason I say that is I think like with the first episode we get here um, of Usher is the religiosity. I don't think I was expecting that the mother, I almost thought I was watching Carrie or reading Carrie by Stephen King. I kept thinking of Carrie a lot with this series. I'm not sure if either of you two did, but the Mask of the Red Death, when the doors get locked, it reminded me of the prom scene in Carrie. Um the religiosity of the mom and like her her heretical fanaticism of Christianity um, is Mike Flanagan. I mean, Hunting of Hill House, I feel, is a little more agnostic in a way. Um, is Midnight Mass just because it has the word mass in it? And I haven't seen Midnight Mass. I have to be honest. I need to watch it now. Is Midnight Mass not based on any literary text? Like, as far as, as I know, knowledge, yeah, go ahead, James. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, as far as I know, I don't believe it is. I believe Mike Flanagan wrote that story, but um, but Andrew, if, if you watch Midnight Mass, you'll see the the amount of of uh, religious connotations in that uh, dwarf um uh, this most recent series. Uh, it is it is a, a fusion of the that, that American Gothic aesthetic with with religious fanaticism and 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 sort of like what what, what Jeffrey was saying about this 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 dark archaic sort of aesthetic with uh modern 
Christianity, which is like so unique and so interesting. Um, and uh, it's it, it also the other thing that I had in my brain just now uh, when Jeffrey was talking about the American side of, of Gothic, uh, of like dark Gothic tales, I, I immediately thought of the film The Witch by Robert Eggers. Um, yeah. And how that really shows the baseline, how like, 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 like Jeffrey said, you didn't have to go too far out for it to just be wilderness. And you, and you had these people that were, um, I, 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 I guess the best word would be fanatics, religious fanatics going up against this unknown environment. And uh, I guess what, when you clash those two things together, people that are extremely religious with this unknown environment, you get a lot of dark mythology out of that to explain things uh, away and to you know uh really just address that feeling of, of of being lost in this this unknown unexplored space uh, you, it spawns all these amazing uh dark mythological stories yeah well and this is ripe for demonic possession with questioning your belief i just saw we covered here the exorcist believer on the podcast, which I really liked. Actually, I thought it was really well done. Um, but, you know, I am curious, do we um, like with the first episode, were you both um, intrigued by Eliza's story? Like, did you feel that we got a lot from setting up this frame with the mother and like these two children who are basically bastard children from the beginning. Um, so like that whole premise of just how the children are seen as corrupt, even if we might disagree that they're not corrupt, right? But like we're being led to believe that they've already come from a decayed line um, and the mother's trying to seek revenge. Um, so yeah, Jeffrey, this first episode... The, the first episode rolls together a lot of familiar themes, I think, of the Gothic. Um, the idea of genealogical inheritance of some kind of curse. Because mm. uh, it, it, often the Gothic is about some, some sort of um, inheritance that has gone awry. Um, there's been a usurper often in Gothic tales, so you need to restore somebody to their rightful position, or it's about some sort of occult or secret in the family history that must come to light. So there's that part of it. And the other part, as you're pointing out, is the religious fanaticism part, which speaks to these, these two forces that are always at loggerheads in American culture. Um, on the one hand is that legacy of religious fanaticism going all the way back to the Puritans. But on the other hand is the whole enlightenment rationalism of the founding fathers, the idea that there should be a bulwark between church and state. Um, I often sort of correct my students who think that the founding fathers were all evangelical Christians, and they absolutely weren't. They, they were enlightenment rationalists who were very concerned about the power of religion uh, to distort perception of reality um, and really wanted to guys like thomas jefferson for example really wanted to sort of keep that at arm's length or benjamin franklin famously um the, there's an anecdote of franklin where he went to hear a preacher in philadelphia and he didn't hear a single practical point like he didn't hear anything that was calculated to improve life for people who were here on this planet and he decided he wasn't going to going to go to church anymore he would just use sunday as a day to, to read um and, and to basically uh, expand his knowledge base. So um, so that religious fanatic part is there. And I think that genealogical inheritance part is there. Uh, it kind of sets things in motion. Um, and I think you're right, actually, to make the connection with Carrie, too, uh, which is certainly playing on that. Um, and, and Stephen King, like, there, there is no worse villain in any of Stephen King than a religious fanatic. Yeah. Um, and you can sort of turn to a whole bunch of different stories. I was thinking about um, The Mist recently, and I'm trying to think of the name of, of the religious fanatic in the supermarket there, uh, who's just just awful. Anytime there's a religious fanatic in Stephen King, um, you know, the person is warped. <laughs> so, yeah. so that connection with Carrie, I think, makes good sense. Well, and that genealogy, you just had me think about, like, out there, before like the t word gothic and i'm so glad you gave us that foundational history jeffrey um like this return it's almost like begging the question about 
blurring the lines between life and death, like returning to the grave or returning to birth. And I'm also thinking about fairy tales because like genealogy and curses are at the root of so many fairy tales. I'm thinking of Sleeping Beauty and the spindle and like that she's going to have to die um, when she touches it, but then she falls into a sleep and then she's saved by a prince. So like fairy tales always have the savior mentality usually with a prince, but we don't get that in this scenario, right? So it is pretty um, hard to distinguish fairy tales from gothic tales. Would you say, Jeff? Like you could have gothic fairy tales. Oh, absolutely. Or are, or um, are fairy tales always gothic, like Hansel and Gretel? I don't know. <laughs> The holiday season may be behind us, but guess what's lurking around the corner? Picture that little baby with a bow and arrow. Yes, Valentine's Day is almost here. And I'm thinking of what gift can I get that my boyfriend will absolutely love and gush over? Well, he is a horror movie fanatic, so I think I have just the thing that he'll die for. Pun intended. My good friend Mandy Bangle is the owner of Mandy Made It, a craft company where she specializes in crochet and pre-cut handmade gifts. So whether your partner is a horror movie fanatic, I'm sure that they have a TV show they love. Maybe there's a book that they love, a music artist, a sports team that they cheer for. Mandy has you covered from shirts, hats, Beanie hats, which I love to wear at the gym, car decals, beer and coffee koozies, keychains, stuffed animals, signs that you want to put all over your apartment. She is ready to create any customized order. So head to Instagram right now. Type in at Mandy Made It. That's M A N D E E Made It. Slide into her DMs and she is ready to start working on your order. Just send her a few ideas. You could say, hey, my boyfriend really loves horror movies, or hey, my boyfriend really loves the Broadway musical, Wicked. I'm sure she will figure out some concoction for you and say that you heard her ad on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room because she's going to give you an exclusive ITBR free gift. She's also working on a new line of ITBR merchandise, so I can't wait to share all of that information with you. Make sure you mention at Ivory Tower Boiler Room when your gift arrives from Mandy so I can share it out on our Instagram. I hope you all enjoy your gifts. Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I'm really excited to talk to you all about one of our ITBR sponsors, Broadview Press. Broadview Press is an independent academic publisher in the humanities that produces high-quality, pedagogically useful books for use in university and college classrooms. They publish mainly in English studies, writing, philosophy, and history. They are always publishing with an eye towards diversity, building a strong list of titles from women, people of color, and authors from other marginalized groups. If you haven't heard my Broadview Press interviews, you need to. Recently, I just had on Dr. Shannon Day, who talked about her book, Beyond the Binary, Thinking About Sex and Gender. And in the summer, I had on Dr. Jason Holt, who gave us all a comprehensive history of what it means to be a philosopher who studies sporting culture. And of course, we went back to ancient Greek, literature, mythology, history, to look at the roots of athleticism. And... Last year, I had on Dr. Jeffrey Andrew Weinstock, who's actually going to be coming on the podcast soon to give his thoughts on the new Fall of the House of Usher Netflix series. He talked all about pop culture for beginners. And Broadview Press is offering an exclusive discount because of our sponsorship. So head to broadviewpress.com where you're going to see such a wide range of literature. Use the code Ivory Tower, I V O R Y. T O W E R for 20% off site wide, all of their books. Again, it's broadviewpress.com. Enjoy your reading. I mean, even, even in the sanitized Disney version, like if you go back to the original fairy tales that were 
started off as folklore folk tales, the ones that were collected by the Grimm brothers, um, they're incredibly dark. Um, the updated versions have been sanitized for children, but nevertheless, they always involve kind of gothic villains in some ways. Um, they typically turn out happy as opposed to sad. But if you think about sort of what their motivations are and what they're seeking to achieve, someone like Cruella de Vil, for example, I'm going to make myself a coat out of puppy skin. Um, you've got some real perverse stuff that's going on. Um, so what I think separates gothic tales from fairy tales perhaps most immediately is a dark and ominous atmosphere mm. um, the fairy tales may have that but ultimately they dispel it as they move forward whereas a gothic tale will seek to maintain that kind of dark ominous atmosphere all the way through um, and we're, we're never assured necessarily of a happy outcome i think yeah Oh, that like just brings up so much, but we're not going to go down all the rabbit holes in my head right now. Uh, <laughs> the fairy tales will be for another. You're making, hopefully they'll do some fairy tale TV shows soon. Um, I would add though that Poe's tales yeah. often end up sounding like fairy tales because they're often displaced in time and place into a kind of once upon a time distant land, something like the fall of the house of Usher, yeah. right? I mean, where and when does that story actually take place? Um, or something like The Mask of the Red Death, yeah. which is set in a kind of medieval setting with a plague ravaging the countryside and a bunch of aristocrats who decide that they're going to let the world burn down around them, but they're going to party the night away. Um, that, to me, was the, is the one that comes closest to being a kind of gothic fairy tale. Yeah, like the Mask of the Red Death could easily be King Arthur's Knights at the Round Table or the Canterbury Tales even begins with like them all just trying to tell tales so they don't have to think about the bubonic plague. Right, um, right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're thanks for that, Jeffrey. You're right. It is that near the distant, you can't place the time, you can't even place the setting sometimes. I would say most of Poe, you, you're right. You can't even place where it is. Yeah. Um, so, James, like anything else from the first episode, James, before we move to your favorite episodes, which might be the first, but. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I definitely that 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 theme of of premature burial of of someone uh, dying and being buried and being resurrected and and the, the line between life and death sort of being blurred. That is a. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Jeffrey knows more than me, but, but a, a super persistent theme through all these gothic stories. Um, a lot of Edgar Allan Poe stories, uh, as well. Like even just Fall of the House of Usher, uh, kind of the same sort of uh plot line taking place of someone that you believe is dead that then comes back to life. Uh, and very, very, uh, unnerving thought, especially if it's like a loved one or someone close to you. Very, very disturbing um so and and so that really really stuck out to me i thought as we said it it set a really strong foundation to kick the story off um you know the fact that he's setting these gothic stories from the 1800s in 2023 or well it really is from the 1960s i believe through to 2023 he has to get us hooked he has to pull us in and uh that was a great opening riff so to speak to to, to accomplish that um so i i really love that i love the way that they uh, all of mike flanagan's shows play with time they jump back and forth uh in time where he will be telling you three different stories that are set in three different spots on the timeline they're all different and you know that they're going to come together in the end i mean that's just a, a byproduct of incredible writing skills on 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 his part where you know, you're telling, I, I believe in the first episode, he is telling us the 2023 storyline with Roger Gusher, you know, at the funeral for several of his children. He is telling us the late 1960s storyline with uh, their mother bursting out of the, the grave to go uh, on, a, on a rampage. Um, and then I believe at the end of the first episode, he brings us into the 1970s uh, or, or or so of of the two of them, of Roderick and Madeline, going into the bar mm -hmm. on New Year's Eve when they're in their 20s uh, after uh, a pretty big event in the story that, of course, we don't find out until later on. So I just love and admire from a writing perspective how seamlessly he's able to do that how he's telling us three different stories that 
are all the same story at different spots in the timeline uh and and it's 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 just so impressive the way that he uh uses that as a setup and the way that he uses it as a really a way to toggle us between these different self not self-contained stories through three different stories that end up being part of a broader uh narrative with all these characters it's very impressive it takes a lot of skill yeah well and I feel that Jeffrey, have you assigned this? I mean, it's so recent, but would you assign or are you going to assign any of these episodes? Because I do feel that Mike Flanagan is giving us, like you've already said, a seminar in 19th century American Gothic, because I kept thinking of Hawthorne's definition of romance, which is where the real and the imaginary meet. And I was thinking of Rappuccini's Daughter, which is one of my favorite Hawthorne tales or The Birthmark. And but Hawthorne, I feel, is always invested in the Garden of Eden going awry and like gender relations in a way where Poe, I think, is doing something different. Um, But, you know, that might just be my take. What do you think, Jeffrey? The difficulty with a miniseries, if you're using it for a class, is it's hard to just take one episode. Um, mm -hmm. it's something I would like to bring in if I could, but it's really hard to just do a little piece of something. But the, one of the differences between Poe and Hawthorne that I think you're right to focus on is Hawthorne had aspirations to literary greatness and was relatively wealthy. So had opportunity to kind of hone his craft and try to create something that he thought would stand the test of time. Poe was perennially in need of cash. Um, so he wrote quickly and attempted to capitalize on various trends and anxieties that were circulating in antebellum American culture. So something like The Mask of the Red Death seems like a kind of timeless allegory until you realize the number of people around Poe who died from tuberculosis, um, which a symptom is coughing up blood. So the Red Death was rife in Poe's time and circulated around him. Um, premature burial, which is a recurring motif in a lot of Poe stories, was a weird preoccupation of 19th century American culture writ large. Um, I think even in the 19th century, people had sufficient medical knowledge most of the time to figure out whether somebody was alive or dead. Uh, but in the same way today, everybody has heard about alien abduction narratives without necessarily giving credence to them. In the 19th century, everybody had heard about people being buried alive. Uh, so there were certain entrepreneurs who capitalized on this by creating ways that if you found yourself in a coffin, you could alert people above ground. The easiest one was a, a, a little tube that went down into the casket and had a string that was put into the uh, the corpse's hand and there was a bell above ground. So if you woke up and you could sort of tug on it to alert somebody. Um, but there were more sophisticated versions of this where you could let somebody above ground know there was a speaking tube. That was another version. Uh, wealthier families could hire a servant to stay by the grave site for a period of time. So if somebody started shouting from below, they could be rescued. There was even a way that you could set up fireworks. <laughs> um, and, and so Poe is playing upon that. Um, a lot of what seems incredible in Poe's fiction were preoccupations and anxieties of this time period that he was seeking to capitalize on because uh, he needed to sell his stories and he was hoping to make some quick cash. Yeah. Wait, did anyone... Do you know the percentage of people who actually were alive still who actually rang a bell? I don't know of a single account of anybody actually ringing the bell. It's funny. There's a documentary about Poe. I'm trying to think about the name of it. It was done by PBS. It's done in three episodes. It's really good. Um, and there's a Poe specialist um, named uh, Gerald Kennedy, Jerry Kennedy, um, who says, yeah, lots of people were buried alive during Poe's time. Um, and, and my simple question to him is, is how would anybody know? <laughs> like, how would you know? Yes, there were certain circumstances um, with, say, yellow fever or mm -hmm. ravaged an area and you had to bury lots of people quickly in mass graves. And that did happen routinely, uh, particularly along the eastern seaboard in the first half of the 19th century. There was no understanding about its being transmission and, and how to avoid it. 
So periodically there would be outbreaks of yellow fever and lots of people would die. So perhaps in situations like that, somebody would be buried prematurely. But again, how would you know <laughs> that anybody had been buried alive? So it, it seems unlikely to me that it happened with any regularity, but it, for whatever reason, people were concerned about it in the 19th century and Poe capitalizes upon that in his fiction. I yeah. think also well, it's a, oh, sorry. No, no, good, James. Yeah. I think also it's a byproduct of just the fact that it was 200 years ago and the documenting of things was, I mean, there were, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, th even like farther back in history, we've documented a lot of stuff, but I think that 200 years ago, things were just different where, where, you know, and, and that kind of adds to the, um, the aesthetic of, of, of sort of Gothic fiction is that, there were just so many unknowns and uncertainties in life where people heard about things, but it wasn't really possible to go through, you know, for people living at that time and fact check and see, well, that story is a bunch of baloney. This story isn't. And when you think about it, that that's a little terrifying <laughs> is that 200 years ago, someone could tell you a scary story about someone that was buried alive and you know, there might not have been as clear cut a way to tell if they were fibbing you or not, because yeah, um, records point. just weren't as detailed and 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 you know arduous as they as they are now. So that that that's kind of scary. That <laughs> we 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 don't know. Like Jeffrey said, we don't know how many people were buried alive, and people living at the time probably weren't sure either. Right. I, I think it probably was a story that got circulated. Um, and people had no way to know whether it was true or not. So, so it becomes an anxiety of the time period. Now, um, grave robbing was, was real. Um, corpses for medical practitioners or medical schools or scientific experimentation were only sort of legally available if they were corpses of executed criminals. So there was here in the U.S., as there was in Great Britain and in the U.K., an underground trade Um sort of punningly named resurrection men who would wait until after the funeral and dig up the corpse and then sell it to somebody. Uh, mm -hmm. That was another reason that wealthier families would leave somebody sitting graveside, kind of watch the site or would put bars or some other way to prevent corpses from being stolen. And there's a, a little detail in the fall of the house of Usher and Poe that the narrator on the way in passes a doctor who's on the way out mm -hmm. um, and doesn't like the looks of him. Um, and this, a suspicion there that Madeline's corpse could possibly disappear, um, which provides a justification for keeping her in the catacomb beneath the house rather than burying her right away. Mm. Well, so like you're reminding me of Victorine is actually that there is a basis in like trying to right there's organ harvesting or like she's trying to like use this technology with the heart to like actually you know uh keep someone alive maybe as a more in immortality in a way it's um it's an interesting prospect that so much of what you're saying jeffrey does have a historical basis but they are all anxieties that we have around death or around you know everlasting life but were you both surprised I was surprised with how much hallucination. Um, maybe I'm not surprised, but as I'm talking through the question, I do think it was interesting because it reminded me of Haunting of Hill House. What I loved about Hill House so much was all of the questioning of psychology and just are they hallucinating their family members? Like grief was such a powerful force in that series and mourning and how do we try to remember someone who's no longer with us but did you like how hallucinations worked here because when you're reading poe and we're in a solitary moment of reading we think it's an unreliable narrator right like roderick is always questioned as an unreliable narrator the narrator of the telltale heart um so many, but here you can't get an unreliable narrator because it's a visual field. So we rely on hallucinations. Like, did it work for both of you? Definitely, definitely. Um, I, 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 as, as a, I mean, as a, as a fiction writer, that is like such a huge influence on me. I love the, 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 the terrifying idea that you 
can't believe your eyes anymore that you are 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 losing it and you don't know anymore what is real and what is imagined and what is paranormal and you know that like there's a great movie um called black swan with, with oh, yeah. natalie portman and she's a ballerina and you you realize over the course of the movie that she's losing her mind and that's a very terrifying thing because you're you, to realize you're losing your grip on reality um it, it very very scary uh when you can't believe your eyes anymore i mean what's more terrifying than that so i love the way that mike flanagan does that i think he's done that in some other series as well where um you know it, it gives you a feeling of nowhere is safe really i mean that i think that's what scares us about ghosts right is that you if you go to a haunted house uh you know these they can they can show up at any time or in your dreams even they can show up in your dreams they can show up at you know at any time uh they kind of just defy physics that way um unlike a you know a tangible monster like a like a zombie or, or something like that ghosts can materialize anywhere and that's very scary but um the the idea of internally you know with within a character that they basically don't know what is real anymore i think of of uh, throughout this series where roger gusher is sitting there with the detective telling his story and the ghosts of his children keep showing up right in front of him staring at him uh and walking around in the background when when the detective can't see them uh and you know things being there that other people can't see except you is just I, I I mean, not to put too fine a point on point on it, haunting, <laughs> extremely haunting, and uh, very very effective. I've played with that a lot with, with my writing with characters that you 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 can't trust them as the reader, and then they reach the point where they can't trust themselves anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent technique in in horror writing. Yeah, Jeffrey, what did you think of the hallucinations with Poe? In his first person narration, you can always raise questions about the reliability of the narrator. And in certain instances, um, it seems quite clear, something like the telltale heart, for instance, that we're dealing with delusion or madness, rather than any objective reality that could be confirmed by anyone else. With Flanagan, I think he signed posts from the start and almost all the way through that what we're seeing is real. Um, I at no point did I really find myself doubting whether the hallucinations represented some kind of objective reality, um, mm -hmm. in part because he has done that with his other series where ultimately the supernatural is affirmed at the end. Everything towards this is leading that way. And as the character Verna, um, which I learned today is an anagram of Raven. I didn't know that before. Um, but as she begins to be a kind of connective tissue among the episodes and ultimately her reality is affirmed, I think everything else that comes with her is affirmed as being part of some kind of objective reality. And as uh, Dupont increasingly begins to see those hallucinations or hear things himself, he begins to share in that. Hmm. Um, so I... In those instances, I found myself sort of more willing suspension of disbelief to believe that what was happening there was actually not a hallucination in the sense of delusion or madness, but instead some kind of supernatural phenomenon that perhaps only one or character could perceive at that moment. So I guess the, the long and the short of it is I didn't really see them as hallucinations as much as part of the, the supernatural overlay of the series. Mm. Okay. Yeah, like you said, because Verna is a realized figure, um, like in our conclusion of the Raven episode, which, yes, uh, Verna, you rearranged the words and it's the anagram of Raven. But I will say I found I was getting a little fatigued by um, the black hat into the telltale heart. And I think like what I realized is... Um, the psychological breakdown of the children like we get the black cat and he falls off the balcony because he thinks he's killing the cat the telltale heart she you know first kills her girlfriend um for leaving her which his murder um but then she keeps hearing the heartbeat which actually is a heartbeat and it's not 
under the basement, um, not the basement, but under the floorboards, like in Poe's story. And it is more of that hallucination. Um, but, you know, then she stabs herself. Even like, I guess I think maybe they feel like they're hallucinating at times or they're questioning their own reality. And then the gold bug, I think is probably our most intense one where she actually thinks that the woman is in the crowd and then the woman is her because she enjoys like that fetish of like, you know, her husband being with these different women who are reenacting roles that she wish she could do in her own life. Um, so I was, my only critique probably of this series is that I feel the way they lined up the storylines was getting a little redundant for me like i'm like okay the black cat the telltale heart and the gold bug like it all was self-inflicted um driven by their own delusions that they're believing like but well i'll say my favorite episode was the mask of the red death probably um i thought it was the most uh the quickest in pace yeah the telltale heart i was getting a little tired i'm like I started speeding the series up. I didn't realize you can like put Netflix series on a 1.5 speed. And then I just started to move the speed. Um, but like, you know, with your critiques, Jeffrey and James, like if you did have a critique of the series, what is your critique? Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. I'm here with Janine, the co-owner of the Soapbox NY located on Long Island. It's a bath and body boutique. And Janine has selected curated Valentine's items great for that special man or woman in your life. They're all gender neutral products. So Janine is going to get us started with her products. Sure. Okay. This is our Finchberry line. They are right out of North Florida. They're a gourmet soap company. The soap I selected to show you today is one of my favorites. This is called Garnet. The scent is grapefruit and lily. This is a beautiful soap that you can use for your hands or body. Their line is vegan. They're all natural. And the scent is just lovely for men and women. They both love it. The second product I'd like to show you is by a company that we also love called Primal. This is their newest product. It is a sponge bar. This soap is glycerin, a uh, natural vegetable-based soap, and the best part about it, it has a natural sea sponge in it, which is biodegradable. The more you use the soap, the softer the sponge gets. It is wonderful for the body, for the face. Um, it, this soap happens to be Aloha scented, but it also comes in three other scents. It is just beautiful. I'd also like to tell you about Mistral. This is one of our French lines. This soap is shea butter based and olive oil based, so it's extra luxurious. Gives you such a nice creamy lather. It's triple milled, so it's super dense and rich, and it lasts you a super long time. Andrew, I think you have some other products. Well, I sell. have one of our favorite companies, Farmhouse Fresh, which um, some of the proceeds go to Animal Rescue, which we just love. So I have here one of their face masks. It's called Sanded Ground. It is a clarifying mud exfoliation mask made with real red Arizona clay. Great for removing toxins, really great for that dry skin that we get in the winter. I'm talking to the guys out there because you don't always use face masks, so I'm always advocating, like myself, putting a face mask uh, regimen just into your skincare routine. So Farmhouse Fresh. And then I have here Beekman 1802, a New York-based company around since 1802, hence the name. It's called Fig Leaf. It is made with goat milk lotion enriched with lavender oil, a great hand and body lotion, very moisturizing. And they actually use fresh fig leaves for the aroma. So we hope you all just have a wonderful Valentine's Day. The Soapbox and Y has great gifts for men women you know even after valentine's day make sure you stop by if you live on long island it's located in port jefferson village also you can call them what is the number janine 631-509-1424 make sure you follow them on instagram and tiktok at the soapbox and why you can dm janine and she'll put together a customized valentine's gift for you okay enjoy your valentine's everyone happy valentine's day thank you LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? 
or have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? Then the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie, in addition to the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog. So you can see all of this on glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W.org. Remember, you get 50% off your subscription of the GL Review magazine when you use the promo code ITBR50. That's 50% off your print or digital subscription when you use promo code ITBR50. To learn more about submitting an article for the GNLR, visit their writer's guidelines. The link is located at the bottom of their homepage. And if you have any questions, email Stephen Hemrick. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot H-E-M-R-I-C-K at glreview.org. The GNLR and its readers can't wait to see what you have to say. I think maybe certain stories they could have leaned into just a little bit more. Uh, Mm -hmm. Like when you just mentioned the telltale heart, that was actually the one moment in in this series where I was kind of like, oh, I, I, I kind of wanted it uh and i don't know if this is just me being selfish because i love the telltale heart there's a great animation of the telltale heart from the 1950s um that it has that cool like old school uh animated sort of effect to it um i can send it to you guys on youtube it's amazing but i was kind of hoping that the telltale heart was going to be a little more uh on the nose that uh it you know the body was going to be under the floorboards or that we were going to actually act out her maybe going up to to a bedroom where someone is sleeping and committing the murder, uh, stuff like that. I, I think maybe Mike Flanagan got a little afraid of being too on the nose with mm-hmm. some of these stories. And I think that the reason why you liked Mask of the Red Death so much, and why I did too, is because that one was very on the nose. That was exactly, uh, or almost exactly, story of mask of the red death you have you just adapted for 2023 instead of a medieval party it is a it's like a rave and uh you know instead of the um the plague coming in and knocking everybody out um it's it's the acid from the ceiling right but um it's the same exact concept right death shows up the red death it's it's just verna and and the red uh flowing red cape with the the with the mask on uh of the of the skull so i think the reason why it worked so well is because it was very on the nose and it was very much just a direct 2023 adaptation of the short story the mask of the red death i think with some of those other episodes uh mike flanagan started to get a little bit more distant from from the source material like the telltale heart yes it had uh an unreliable protagonist to it right and 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 in that character, the doctor, uh, where she's hearing this heart, you don't know if it's real or fake, but um, I thought that it could have been a little more on the nose, like a little more close to the way the original story plays out, and people wouldn't have had a problem with it. But I think maybe Flanagan was a little afraid of that, so he sort of went more in his own direction with it. I'd say that was my only critique of those those middle episodes. <laughs> And it was realistic. Like you're saying, you didn't like that. She There actually was a heart. I Like, I agree. I kind of wanted there to be something where this is a figment of her. Imag- like, she's just descending into the right. um, madness. I also was surprised that Roderick actually saw the girlfriend's body, too. I don't know if I liked that Roderick was that involved with the children sometimes. Like, actually seeing the murders that were committed or being there at the scene of the crime. Um, but yeah. Um, Jeffrey, like if you have a critique, what's right, right, right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't have major critiques of it. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the series, which was campier and more fun than some of Flanagan's more recent outings. I think he really was having a lot of fun with this one. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the Midnight Club, which came before this, which but you know it's a lot heavier in some respects. 
um, midnight mass was serious from start to finish. And this I thought was just quite a lot of fun. Um, I have, you know, I think the conclusion is a little heavy handed with its referencing of the opioid epidemic and the implication of pharmaceutical companies. You, he gives you one of those final episode monologues uh, just to make sure that you're getting the point of Fortunato uh, Pharmaceuticals. So maybe that could have been a little toned down. I think it, it does drag a little bit in the middle with the episodes that you're talking about with the black cat and telltale heart. Um, once you've, once the formula becomes clear um, mm -hmm. after those first few episodes, it, it drags a little bit before it then regains its tempo. I think uh, I'm, I'm not bothered that they diverge from the source text in sometimes significant ways. Um, the gold bug episode has nothing to do with Poe's the gold bug. It has more to do with William Wilson um, and Berenice, which is Poe's yeah. really ghoulish one about extraction of teeth <laughs> from a living woman who is presumed to be dead. Um, that doesn't bother me. But on the whole, though, I thought it was just quite a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, why was the wife saved in the Mask of the Red Death? Like, what did you two think about that we actually get a survivor? Like, talk about coming back from the dead. I mean, an acid attack, I don't think will leave you alive, but um, I'm not a, you know, I'm not an MD, um, but it does seem like she does give us the Lenore storyline, like with her daughter, there is that through line we needed. So yeah. Why a survivor? Maybe they were, and, and I, I don't know this for sure, but I, I got the sense that they were trying to paint Verna, AKA the Raven as sort of not a not an evil figure mm -hmm. so to speak uh that's that's out to really torment and and destroy and, and and things like that um i think that maybe flanagan was trying to tie her to death as a as a character uh that you know whenever you you have these these personifications of death in in in, in fiction um you know i can think of a few just like um sort of the angel of death in the hellboy uh the one hellboy movie and and stuff like that death is 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 often kind of portrayed as almost this this grimly neutral sort of character you know almost like the 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 blind uh lady justice with the scales like well i'm not here to make judgments i'm not here to to reap this horrible you know to, to torture people i don't decide who who lives and who dies mm. you know and, and i almost got that sense from verna where it, in a lot of the dialogue with her she doesn't come across as malicious she comes across more as a a, a personification of, of death as the, the sort of neutral force that is when it when it comes for you it's gonna come for you and you might die a horrible death you might die you know a peaceful death asleep in your bed uh but but i almost got the sense from her that she's not malicious that she's just the force of death itself and you know she had a contract with the ushers they and we finally find that out towards the end that they sat down at the bar that night and basically drank to a deal with her that well you're going to have immense success and and live this amazing luxurious lifestyle and so are, so will your children but just before your death roderick your whole family line will end um and they agree to it because they're power hungry <laughs> and uh you know they kind of forget about it they don't worry about it for a while and then of course you know the debt arrives and they all get wiped out so that's kind of what I think of when I think of, 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 of Verna and why there would be a survivor from from mm. from the Mask of the Red Death rave. And, you know, just before the acid falls from the ceiling, she goes around and she's whispering in the, mm. the ears of all of the um, bartenders and waitresses and everything. And they all leave uh, as if she's trying to focus that on the person who owes the debt and and you know th there's also a lot of bit of a, a, i noticed a lot of class themes with it too with verna she she points out uh you know like with uh you know the way that the wealthy are exploiting uh mm -hmm. middle class or working class people right like in um the rue morgue when uh with the 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 monkeys that they're experimenting on 
she goes on a, a big monologue to Camille about, you know, the, 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 these horrifying things about animal testing. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, I can, I, I can think of with, with a lot of the deaths of the children, she monologues about the way in which rich people are exploiting everybody else. Right. So there's a little bit of class stuff going on there too, but I sort of see her as almost a neutral personification of death, that it doesn't take sides too much, that it's just there to, if you owe a debt and you have to pay it, that's it. It's no, nothing personal. Yeah. So she's kind of like a Rumpelstiltskin or the fates of ancient Greece. I, I actually saw her more as like a ancient Greek figure. Um, like that she really, in my opinion, she's not religious, Verna. Like she is more of that polytheistic essence. Um, but yeah. And also I love her acting too. She's like, probably it's my favorite acting um, that Carla uh g how do you say her last name i'm trying to remember carla um what's her name oh gagino okay um yeah, yeah. but jeffrey yeah what did you think of that there are some survivors not everyone okay. perishes verna is fascinating because to my mind she is flanagan's mean to convey his messages she's mm. the vehicle to let us know what's right and what's wrong. She's the kind of moral compass in a way of the entire series. Um, so the reason that Marilla doesn't die is because uh, there's a kind of moral valuation of her that's taken place where she's reluctant to go to the party in the first place. She's tempted, but ultimately it doesn't look as though she's going to succumb to temptation. Um, and because she's marked as being a good character, or at least Flanagan wants us to consider her as being a good character, um, she escapes. She should have listened and left. But as James is pointing out, Verna also does whisper into the ears of the staff that they need to leave because he's trying to limit you know, civilian damage. <laughs> um, there's also the moment where Verna is talking with Frederick and I, something along the lines of, but when you went to the teeth, that's when I knew um, you know, your end was sealed, so to speak. Um, so Verna is the moral compass of the episode, pointing out who deserves to live, who deserves to die, who deserves to be punished, who deserves to escape unscathed. And playing that role, she becomes Flanagan's voice, I think, telling us how we're supposed to regard the characters. Yeah. Well, and as we're nearing the end, which just went by, woo, so quick, but like, Jeffrey, to follow up with that, is there a character that you were so um, desolate and uh, upset that they actually did die? Like, is there someone where you feel like Flanagan, not that he didn't execute their downfall, but they really didn't deserve um, to, you know, die from this curse? Like, they really were morally good people. They were a morally good person, and they just ended up in the wrong family. Initially, I felt that way about Frederick, but then he turns out to be the nastiest of the lot when mm. he takes Marilla home and pulls out the teeth. Um, no, not really. I, I think they're all despicable and they all get the expected comeuppance that they seem to deserve in the end. Yeah. I would I say... That... That... Oh, no, Jay, I was just... No, go ahead, James. Yeah, no. You might say oh, the person I'm thinking of. Yeah, I was, I was going to say. Well, well, Lenore is 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 pictured as, as being, you know, the he. I think they even say, "Oh, she's the best of us," um, because she's she's a kid. She she's not really. Uh, she hasn't. You could say she hasn't been corrupted yet by by this this wealthy lifestyle, and that's where you kind of see this thing again with Verna, where she doesn't. She's not trying to be cruel. She's just fulfilling this contract. Uh, you know, she sits down next to Lenore and she's kind of like, damn, I, I really don't want to do this. You're a really great kid. I, there are parts of my job that I hate. And she, I think she touches her on the forehead and just instantly kills yeah. her. And then she, she gets the, the least amount of suffering with, with her death. Um, so I, I think, I think that yeah. kind of shows us with, with Verna is this like moral compass sort of person. Yeah. Like she just gets put to sleep forever. Yeah. Um, 
Well, and I was going to say, what was Tamerlane's biggest sin? Because maybe I'm just like misremembering, but like with her William Wilson, like the twinning, I don't know. I guess I kind of felt for her because she was um, uh, like so unfulfilled in her relationship. Like he seemed like a good, you know, husband or partner, but um, yeah, I mean, I guess she was extremely like greedy with maybe pulling up the wool over everyone's eyes with the gold bug company. But yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe I just saw her doing this beauty industry. Uh, you know, they connect her to Gwyneth Paltrow's goobs. So I'm like, oh, well, you know, she's not that bad compared to like, you know, pulling someone's teeth out or killing their partner. I was surprised. I thought that the like husband was going to come back or, you know, something was going to... um transpire with him but you know the the whole like mirror uh shattering there were some really interesting um just effects that were done i thought the effects were incredible in the series um but yeah so lenore i guess we could all agree that she probably is the you know most ethical one the uh she has a good heart um Okay, so my last question is, you know, what are you taking away from this series? Like, is there something that this series did to deepen your understanding of Poe? Or had you even like see one of his stories from a new, completely different perspective just because of this retelling of sorts? Um, James, I'll start with you. Yeah, um, I, I mean, every adaptation that I've seen like Flanagan do uh has been just astounding and 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 I think that looking looking at these stories through a different lens through the lens of of a a wealthy pharmaceutical company family in 2023 uh I I, I think there's a lot there I think that it, it it does sort of reveal a lot of these themes that we've been talking about um like you know uh like 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 greed and 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 exploitation you know by these by these wealthy people and um you know it, it does sort of reveal them in a in a in a different light and i bet that if you took enough time you could probably dig a lot of themes out of these that you wouldn't have seen um you know i think that it, it kind of goes back to what you said towards the beginning that these are these are timeless stories that uh like mask of the red death could take place in any kingdom with you know being ravaged by a plague it could be in the middle ages or it could be in a present day like a rave the way that they did it in this show right uh the poem the city in the sea i mean where does that take place we have no idea um i i i think the biggest thing for me from 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 watching this is just the way it shows how universal and timeless these stories are and i think that that really shows edgar Allan poe's incredible skill as a writer that he created these 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 self-contained worlds that can be applied just as easily to present day as they did you know almost 200 years ago which is very very impressive mm. yeah how about you jeffrey it just highlights for me how uh, oh, yeah. American culture and the literary landscape that the fam th these stories are not made necessarily familiar to everyone, um, but they're familiar to a lot of us. And even if we haven't read them necessarily, we've probably heard of them or we know a little bit about them. Uh, it just reinforces, to my mind, that that Poe, I think, more than than perhaps any other author is the quintessential american author yeah yeah and now i feel like we all should i have to rewatch because like even you know thinking of our discussion together i'm thinking of all of the rooms in the mask of the red death and i'm thinking wait every child has a different color palette that matches the mask of the red death so i feel like there's like you said so many easter eggs jeffrey that like it begs a rewatch for certain uh, storylines. Um, and I know, like I said, that was my last question, but I am just curious. Do you think that um, 
there is like a moral argument here in the episode, like not episode, but is Mike Flanagan making almost a slasher film Halloween type argument that like if you go too far with excess or sexuality or, you know, wealth, like there's always an excess. It kind of does seem almost as if it's a moral panic narrative. Like you can't go too much into pleasure because then the acid's going to fall on you. <laughs> like, I mean, is this just back to the basics of the like slasher film rules? I think, I, know. Uh, I think it's, it's probably back to basics for just the Gothic genre overall. Cause uh, I, um, you know, I, when I think of, the gothic genre i i get that picture in my head of these these beautiful ornate castles that are kind of falling apart like dracula's castle right um i think that that, that the gothic genre is really about uh excess leading to decay and 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 terror uh so you know you, you see it with midnight mass you see it with bly manor and and the midnight what well, maybe not as much with the midnight club but with um, a lot of Mike Flanagan's adaptations, you see, it's it's that basic gothic idea of excess that then becomes decay, uh, and which is very very scary. Like these, like I said, these big, you know, ornate castles that are in ruins that have like monsters and ghosts living inside. It's uh, it's very uh, back to basics gothic, and I I, I love that so much. It, it has a moral component to it for sure. Yeah, Jeffrey, do you feel the moral the morality's heavy handed or you um, can enjoy some pleasure here? Okay, so the Gothic to me is always fascinating in this respect. Uh, it's uh, Fred Botting, who is a, a critic of the Gothic, who has called it famously the literature of transgression, that it's always about people who overstep the bounds of good taste and morality and ultimately get punished for it. Now, there's two ways to think about the Gothic, I think. The first is you could say that it ends up being remarkably conservative, that you have these people who act in ways that are unsanctioned by law or culture and get punished for it in the end. And ultimately, the status quo is reestablished. Um, or you can say that really that's just kind of an alibi at the end that allows us to enjoy the messy middle part, that it, it's really about that. I think James is right, that it's always about excess, that uh, lead that transgression that ultimately leads to some kind of come up and some kind of downfall. And it does tend to convey a moral message in the end, although often it's not terribly convincing. <laughs> um, it's there to kind of placate the guardians of good taste and morality when really the fun part is all the chaos and the excess in the middle when everything goes off the rails, right? That's the part that we enjoy. And then it gets wrapped up with a little homily at the end. Then it makes people feel better about the fact that, you know, they just watched people getting acid burning their faces away um, or be sliced in half by some kind of pendulum. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so yeah, uh, it, it's the same thing as a slasher movie um, or any other kind of um, gothic tale that wraps things up and tells us, you know, uh, not to go too far, for sure. Yeah, and I think, you know, for everyone out there, if you haven't read the play Dr. Faustus, I feel like this is a very Faustian um, making, you know, a bargain with um, a demonic type Actually, I think it's the devil. So I could just say the devil. Um, I don't have to be too vague about it. Um, morality plays. Yeah. So you both have just like provided so much gothic food to nourish on for us. Uh, so, you know, thank you for the conversation. I, you know, can't wait to have you back on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room again. Let's see, you know, what my, Mike Flanagan does next. I'm curious. Um so, Jeffrey, how can everyone follow you, you know, your website, uh, your social media, like anything you want to um, plug right now, you know, um, all the projects you're doing? Yeah, I have a, a I'm sure if anybody wants to check out my website, it, it's just my name, JeffreyAndrewWeinstock.com. Wonderful. Um, and, you know, Jeffrey also has the Society for the study of the American Gothic, right? Is that the full name, Jeffrey? 
Oh, you glitched out a little bit. What was the question? Oh, there? sorry. Um, and you also have the organization, your Gothic organization, right? How could people yes, follow um, that on Facebook? Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. It's um, we new organization, the Society for the Study of the American Gothic, which is a professional organization for people who write about, research, and teach the American Gothic. Uh, and you can look for us on Facebook. American Gothic Society is the name of the group. Wonderful. And then James, how can everyone follow you? Um, and I think you have a of website course. too. I do. Yes. Uh, my writing website is James Yeary writing dot com uh that's james and my my last name is y-e-a-r-y -E so james yuri writing.com i have a, a short story collection and a novella out right now um and i have a new short story collection coming out probably sometime next month uh and on my website you can read uh some of my excerpts of my short stories uh and 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 such and i i try to keep uh my readers updated on there uh i also do have a story come out coming out on a podcast soon i can't talk too much about it but very soon uh a story that i wrote recently will be on uh, a decently major podcast so i'll be announcing that on my uh website and uh my instagram is james underscore yuri except james has a z instead of an s <laughs> on instagram great and i have jeffrey and james's links to everything in the show notes so just go there click you know, follow them on social media. Um, yeah, this has been such a wonderful time. Maybe James, your next, if we see like your new novella is called Usher Reimagined, uh, give us credit for <laughs> anything from the conversation. No, no, no. But <laughs> thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, James. And um, yeah, I hope everyone out there enjoyed this series as much as we did. You know, we had some critiques, but I think overall we're major fans of this series. Um, so, yeah, thank you both. And, you know, bye to everyone out there listening. <laughs>